Unlike Lake Macquarie residents who face enormous rate hikes on recently revalued waterfront properties, the Newcastle increase will be an across-the-board 6.7%. The rates, which were decided on at last night's council meeting, were set on 1984 land values and will mean an estimated $42.5 million in revenue. Although council admits that using the old figures made its job easier, it does not expect the same problem as Lake Macquarie when its new figures are released in 1992. According to council, land values will rise proportionately in the next few years. Although a spokesman from the Real Estate Institute of Australia confirmed this, he suggested pockets of land in Merriweather, Merriweather Heights, New Lambton, Maryville and Walls End may experience a jump in value and most likely in rates within the next few years. Lake Macquarie Council is due to set its rates next week. If Australia is riding on the sheep's back, it could well be heading for a fall. There's no solution without pain in this problem. We're in a, we're in a situation now where it's going to be painful whatever we do. It's going to be a lot of people are going to get hurt. Scone grazier Peter Bishop is calling for a drastic rethink by the Australian Wool Corporation, who with government support has reaffirmed a basic floor price for wool at 700 cents per kilo. That means if the bales aren't sold on the market to traders, the Wool Corporation guarantees to buy the wool at 700 cents. With a downturn in international markets, the corporation has been forced to buy most of the wool. In the last six months, the stockpile has risen from 2 million to 4 million bales. But Peter Bishop says this makes no sense. He says wool should be sold at whatever price the market can pay. What we've got to do is get the market going again with bargain priced wool. Let the buyers pay what they're prepared to pay. Don't tell them what they've got to pay because they just won't do it. In a bid to cut wool production, the Wool Corporation has called for a quota to be placed on producers of 75% of last year's crop. But Bishop says each sheep still has to be shorn despite the quotas. And in effect, each producer will create their own farm stockpiles. It's a minefield that it'll, it'll create a black market in non-quota wool, um, people can't afford to store it in their wool shed, it would be chaotic. Mm. Mr Bishop says the Wool Corporation has been naive and is definitely out of its depth. Their response to the falling world price has been very bad and uh, it is entirely a function of their failure to recognise the market that has landed us in, in the spot we're in now. The tears were flowing at Edgeworth's St Benedict's Primary School today, the latest mark on the immunisation hit list. We're running an immunisation campaign in the West Lakes area, which is where we had a number of cases notified a couple of weeks ago. And uh, in that situation we're immunising all the primary school age children before the schools break up for Christmas. Over the last eight days, more than 3,500 children have felt the prick of the nurse's needle as health authorities move quickly in a bid to contain the measles epidemic. From January to September last year, only 21 cases of measles were reported. This year, the figure is 371, with the Hunter one of the major centres of the outbreak. We've seen uh, approximately 150 cases in the... Uh, Hunter area 
around the outskirts of Newcastle in fact. And what would you see in a non-epidemic year? Well we see very few cases in a non-epidemic year. The immunisation blitz will continue in the West Lakes area tomorrow, but doctors have urged all parents to have their children protected from the potentially deadly disease. Every now and again you get a really severe uh, complication and the most severe complication is encephalitis or inflammation of the brain. And uh, in America it's been estimated that one in about 4,000 cases uh, can develop this kind of disease and perhaps die from it. Bruce McKenzie, NBN News. When the HSC is completed, it will mark the end of school for about 6,500 hunter teenagers. Of these, around 2,500 will go on to tertiary education. That leaves more than 4,000 who will be searching for jobs, and they will be joined by around 2,000 year 10 school leavers to enter an already struggling labour market. CES vacancies statewide are down and unemployment is up. In the Hunter, the figure is running at more than 30% above the state average. But according to those in the retail sector, it's not all doom and gloom. It is a, an employing um, industry of, of youth um, and it is the industry which continues to, to increase um, as an employer of our young people, um, particularly here in the Hunter. The track scheme is helping train students for jobs in the retail and hospitality sector, which last year was the Hunter's main employer. Though many major retailers say their staffing levels are pegged, the situation is expected to improve early next year. Rebecca Skinner, NBN News. The Dora Creek Workers and Bowling Club is the hub of the township. It's also becoming the centre of attraction for busloads of local bowlers keen to get a closer look at the new supergrass green. It's a low maintenance synthetic weave resembling cooch grass. It cost $80,000 and took just two weeks to lay. The soft bristles are packed with a top dressing of fine beach sand. The result is a fast, hard wearing, all weather playing surface, originally developed for American gridiron football. And it, it can be regular your pace by the, how much water you put into it and what rolling you give it. So it's a green that can run from anything from uh, well up to 18 or 19 seconds or something like that, depending on what the members require. At this stage, it's trial and error with all of us because we've never played on one before. The super cooch needs only an hour's rolling each week. No insecticides or chemicals are needed. The club has offered its greenkeeper a job in the bar. Computers took over from office workers, so it looks like some teddy's going to take over from drone keepers. The prosecution alleged Andre Chena stabbed her three victims whose bodies were found yesterday at Bexley in Sydney's south. The court was told Cheryl Ann Najib was killed on Monday along with Chena's eight-year-old daughter Sandy. Her nine-year-old daughter Suzanne was stabbed to death on Wednesday. Ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of Atlantis and crew in the classified Department of Defense flight. Houston now controlling. Roll maneuver underway.
The strike was called yesterday. Today the unemptied garbage bins were beginning to overflow. Though swimming pools at West Wall's End, Swansea and Spears Point are open, they will be closing at lunchtime over the weekend. Beaches at Redhead, Blacksmiths, Catherine Hill Bay and Caves Beach have been without regular patrols. But over the weekend the surf life-saving clubs will extend surveillance there. All roadworks have halted. Mayor Ivan Welsh says in order to finish work on local roads by the end of the year, contractors have been called in. But workers' jobs are not threatened. Although he does believe the council has to be competitive. If our outdoor staff um, can do the job at the same rate and the same cost, fine. I, I can't see a problem with that. What we would like to do, if we can, is to... Um, have our outdoor staff tender for the same jobs. It will at least show that we're competitive and that's what we're after, a, a, a proper rate for the people of Lake Park. This is the third strike over the past week by council workers to go before the Arbitration Commission. Two unrelated disputes in Cessnock and Newcastle are still to be resolved, though staff have returned to work. Residents of Ballina were warned to stay indoors as uniformed and plainclothes police combed the suburbs in the hunt for two men who attempted to rob a Commonwealth bank in River Street shortly before 10am. The pair, armed with an M15 assault rifle and a high-powered handgun, fled in a getaway car, firing several shots at pursuing police. Bullets shattered one patrol car windscreen and penetrated the bonnet, but the officers on board were unhurt. After crashing their car, the gunman fled on foot. Police mounted a door-to-door -door search of surrounding suburbs, stopping all vehicles and conducting searches of possible hiding places. Police told residents the men were regarded as extremely dangerous. In relation to those offenders, one fellow was uh, calling the other fellow Dave, that means anything. Late today, police received word the gunman had found shelter and scrub at a nearby golf course. At this stage, the bushland is closed off while police decide whether to tighten the cordon or wait for the men to emerge. Gourmet food is, uh, shall we say, a consuming interest of mine. Forty TAFE students volunteered to build the raised gardens at Glendon School. The project is their final practical lesson before the end of year exams, but it's much more than an exercise. The seven metre diameter paved garden will provide the young mentally and physically disabled students of Glendon with new avenues of exploration. All 50 native plants in the garden will be raised above ground level so students in wheelchairs can tend and enjoy the plants from the same perspective as more able-bodied children. The pavers, copper logs and plants were all paid for through donations, work should be completed this evening, the garden flourishing within a matter of weeks. It's him. Who? Oh. Flavio Paderet turned in a stunning performance to win last year's Junior Pro event from a star-studded field and is naturally seated number one for the Pacific Dreams event this year. The likeable blonde Brazilian knows that another victory means more than straight prize money. The winner of this contest gets the wire card on the VHP and uh, it's going to be a good help for me if I get it, you know. So I'm just trying hard as, as I do in every contest, you know, advance all the heats and just try to get on the final. In today's second round, mixed fortunes for the local lads. Nicky Wood was stunning in waves that were non-existent for a long period, but the talented Wood carved his moniker on more than one little wave. Carl Palmer in pink was impressive in the same heat to advance to the third round of the Pro Junior. Wood's Merriweather teammate Shane Power was less fortunate and crashed out of the contest in heat 10 of the second round. Another Brazilian, Victor Rebas, stole the limelight and the ticket to round three with an excellent array of manoeuvres in the difficult conditions and he shapes as one to beat. Powell was relegated to third when Will Weber in white surfed superbly to force his way into the next round where he comes up against another local. 
Mighty midget Chad Edzer keeps on improving with every performance and in heat 11 he blitzed his rivals and cut back followed by slashing re-entries heralded the arrival of Edzer in round three. Paul Woyboys also snapped a couple of good rides but his points weren't sufficient to see him through as Grant Frost just edged ahead to continue his surge in the Pacific Dreams Pro Junior. Late this afternoon in round three of the Pacific Dreams Pro Junior, Merriweather's Nicky Wood served brilliantly to advance along the road to victory. In his last junior contest and in his hometown, Wood is desperate to grab a win and go out on a high note. However, just to hand, Chad Edzer has been knocked out in heat five of round three. The lay day gave competitors an ideal chance to acclimatise to the treacherous Newcastle Beach surf, but Bronte's Rod Kerr and Hawaiian John Shimuka were two of only a handful who took up the opportunity. The others may live to regret their decision, as organisers are determined the event will go ahead at its traditional location. I think so. Everyone likes to see the top surfers get tested, and um, this will we'll test them, that's for sure. Still, many found the break at Nobby's Beach challenging enough. A slick whitewater repertoire was required, and local boy Dave MacArthur showed he's certain to be a force to be reckoned with in the main event. Others to show good form were Queenslanders Jason Buttonshaw and Shane Bevan, while the morning session was dominated by a powerful Luke Egan and world scholastic champ Jake Spooner. Big results in the Quicksilver Surf League and Margaret River events have the Merriweather boys primed for a supreme effort. Even before that, the boys did pretty good in Brazil. Matt Hoy got a second, I got a fifth. and uh, So, you know, everyone's on a bit of a roll at the moment and just hope we can keep it up here in Newcastle. The Coca-Cola trials begin tomorrow with world champion-elect Tom Curran in the first heat. Bruce McKenzie, NBN News. It appears Newcastle offers a lifestyle which appeals to nurses. The Hunter region last figures are 100, 100 vacancies, which is 5% of the workforce up here. Now that's well under the state average, which is currently running at 7%. Although the vacancy rate in Newcastle is below the state average, an intense campaign has been launched to attract school leavers to the profession. Since it began last week, more than 300 calls have been received from throughout the state. Not a lot is known by the public about the actual opportunities that are available in nursing. We're promoting that nursing has more opportunities than any other profession for somebody who's, who takes it up. And that's what we're saying to school children, this is the number one career choice that you, that you should think about. Over the years the profession has undergone an image change and it's this which organisers of the half million dollar campaign are pushing. Professional rates of pay now mean that nurses are very well paid. The career structure that was introduced in 1986 gives nurses an opportunity to be rewarded for clinical expertise that they didn't have before. There's been more part-time work created so that married women who've got children can work part-time. Uh, Childcare facilities have been built at a lot of hospitals that give them that um, extra um, uh, ability to come back to work. So there's been a lot of changes. Concerned residents turned up in force, worried that their increased land valuations could spell an equally high increase in their rates. Though the council has requested a one-year reprieve from the new valuations from the Department of Local Government, it hasn't yet been forthcoming. So tonight, aldermen discuss the options available, which include the levy of a separate garbage charge, increasing the minimum rate above the statutory limit, which requires the minister's permission, levying a differential rate to reduce the effect of high increases in valuations, and levying a higher differential rate in commercial and industrial properties. The residents were not allowed to give their input. Mayor Ivan Welsh warned that any interjections from the gallery would result in its ejection.
50 of the region's finest young footballers have been attending an invitation-only clinic run by the Newcastle Rugby League. The initiative is seen as the first steps to introducing the emerging talents to a school development program that will hopefully see these under-21 rugby league exponents go on to representative honours. Last night's session was the last in a five-week program that centred on new skill drills, sprint training under recognised coaches, conditioning and the overall different aspects of training. Coordinated by John Anderson and Keith Onslow, the enthusiasm shown has the coaching staff excited and it is envisaged the clinic will now become an annual NRL fixture. The Coal Association wanted to see under closely monitored circumstances the effects of long wall mining on houses. A month ago this project house was built in the direct path of panel 3 of the West Walls and Colliery. A 135 metre wide panel has now been extracted 200 metres under the house and according to Coal Association measurements the house has fallen just over 26 centimetres. The damage is noticeable. Around 60 hairline cracks have been found inside, mostly in corners or above windows. One door becomes stuck while the laundry door refuses to even open. The kitchen bench has moved a centimetre from the wall and outside, although there are few cracks in the brickwork, the surrounding cement slabs show signs of movement. I guess it's about what we expected. Uh, there's perhaps more hairline cracks in the plaster than I would have expected. Uh, I guess in that sense I'm a layman now. Someone from the Mine Substance Board who looks at these things all the time might have known what to expect more than I did. But, uh, there's certainly some damage that if it was my house I'd want repaired, there's no doubt about that. The house in Withers Street is open to the public this Sunday and should be of special interest to residents of the Bolton Point area. The depth of mining is about the same, uh, the width of, of mine extraction is about the same and the, uh, the amount of substance is very close to the same as well. I think Bolton Point is probably slightly less than this but, but of the same order. The next stage of the $1.5 million research project is already underway at Curry. The third stage really is research and that's to come up with a better design for houses that can tolerate subsidies in the future. It's springtime in the Barrington Tops and Scotch Broom is in flower. 10,000 hectares have been covered by the bush, the worst infestation in Australia. The worry with Scotch Broom is its dominance. All other vegetation is overrun, even fire trails are smothered. Trying to find a biological pathway through the problem is scientist John Hosking. With the Department of Agriculture, the CSIRO, National Parks and a $100,000 donation from Kerry Packer, Hosking has come up with a new hope. A tiny insect called the twig mining moth introduced from New Zealand. In Europe and in New Zealand it causes dead patches in a lot of the trees, makes the plants a lot less healthy and in some of the smaller plants it will actually kill them. The moth will be kept in quarantine for final checks before it's introduced into the tops next year. Around 80 other insects are known natural predators of the weed and it's expected some of these will also be used. Farmers have been battling Scotch broom since it was introduced in 1840. While there has been some success with chemical sprays, it's a costly exercise. John Hosking says the twig mining moth isn't the complete answer, but it's a positive step. You might be still looking at a 10 to 20 percent ground cover after biological control, but it's still a lot better than this virtual 100 percent ground cover that we're getting in the area at the moment. The Board of Tomago Aluminium meets in December to decide whether to build the third pot line. The expansion would increase the plant's output by 75%. A builder for the two-year project has been chosen and the go-ahead is conditional on environmental approval. The State Government Commission of Inquiry meets again next Tuesday and may hand down its decision then. The company's decision to invest is conditional on an industrial agreement between the 12 unions which would be covered by the building phase of the project. That agreement was ratified today, after three weeks of negotiations completed in record time. 
We want to make sure that this project succeeds and that more projects come to the Hunter Valley as a result of this flagship agreement. In its first year, 1,200 building workers will be employed. The expansion will provide an additional 400 permanent jobs. The union movement was keen not to be seen as an obstacle to this kind of investment coming to the region. The builders anxious to finish the project on time and with an enviable safety record.